Hello and welcome once again to the series of interviews that we have been doing with uh, key people in this uh, fast developing but really critical India-Australia partnership, especially now that uh, you know our Prime Minister has been there and uh, the Prime Minister of Australia has visited India. Um, I think this is the right moment to have a young uh, scientists and uh, uh, eminent personalities that are living in uh, Australia. Today we have with us a special guest, um, Mr. Tabish Ahmed. Uh, he, as an accomplished chemical engineer and material scientist, has been honored with the Australian Prime Minister's Distinguished Global Talent Award. He became the youngest recipient of this distinguished and highly competitive award. Um, he has also primarily uh, worked primarily in the research and development aspects of energy and chemical manufacturing, uh, having worked in research centers and universities that are very prestigious, like uh, that of the University of Queensland, University of Newcastle, and distinguished companies such as the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, one of the world's leading oil producing firms. Uh, Tavish is presently working as a chief research scientist and head of global research and development department of a leading personal and home care products company, Pentel Products, Victoria, Australia. Tavish, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Rami, for inviting. And it's a pleasure to get connected to you and your viewers at Global Order. Thank you, Tavish. Let's get straight into it. Uh, let me begin by asking you, uh, why don't you trace us through your journey to becoming the youngest recipient of the Australian Prime Minister's Global Talent Award. Yeah, firstly, I'm incredibly humbled to have been awarded with Australian Prime Minister's Global Talent Award. It's, it's a recognition that I deeply cherish, but I wouldn't have been able to achieve this without the support and collaboration of my esteemed colleagues and mentors. So I should say that I should trace back my journey back to India when this journey began, when I developed a keen interest in chemistry during my high school years. And this curiosity was nurtured by my teachers and mentors from the city where I basically belong to in North India, which is the city of Aligarh. And my passion for making an impact through scientific research actually got ignited uh, through the Aligarh University when I earned my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. And I eventually uh, moved to University of Queensland just after my undergraduate studies where I had the chance to work with uh, the leading academics and researchers in the field. So that was the time back almost 11 years ago when I already got a taste of Australia just after my undergraduate studies. Then it, it all took, took uh, I should say, a turn when I moved to pursue my master's studies or higher education in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. And later on, after graduating there with a master's degree, I had again a privilege of furthering my career in diverse environments, including uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, where I was a part of significant projects in the gas research center. So that was actually the time when I started understanding the importance of free research, how it can transition the world of energy and chemical manufacturing. In 2020, I got an opportunity to come to Australia, which is only three years back at the University of Newcastle's Global Innovative Center for Advanced Nanomaterials. And at the University of Newcastle, I was working to develop novel silica-based nanomaterials, which had the great ability to tackle the biggest problems our planet is facing, that is the climate change. So these nanoparticles, which were really novelly discovered, had capability to absorb carbon dioxide and hence great uh, addition to our low emission technologies. And for this research work, within a ma matter of just one year, I was very lucky to be awarded with Australian Prime Minister's uh, Distinguished Global Talent Award. And I believe receiving this honor, it's, it's also a reminder of the responsibilities that come with it. My journey thus far has been one of uh, continual learning and individual accomplishment, but pushing the boundaries. It's a testament of, I believe, collective effort of many people who are working together. And it passionates and it puts a great resonance on me to continue driving this innovation for the betterment of society and our planet. Uh, that's fantastic. And, you know, one thing about uh, the very talented Indian diaspora that always stands out is their humility, irrespective of the successes 
that they receive. But, um, you know, you spoke about silica-based nanomaterials. Um, I have to be candid, I don't know much about it. So could you walk us through the different issues that you aim to tackle through your research to develop silica-based nanomaterials? So nanomaterials was something which I was working very, very closely when I was at the University of Newcastle. But even today, I am in very much touch with the University of Newcastle. Now talking about nanotechnology, it plays a very important part in many fields today from biomedicine to energy and climate. Talking about uh, nanoparticles, Rami, you said, so engineered nanomaterials are they are chemical substances or materials with particle size just between one to 100 nanometers or one third of a human hair. So you can imagine how small or nano they are. But they have an amazing uh, adaptability as well as uh, their application today. One of them is in the environmental sustainability. Now, one of the most significant issues which nanotechnology can aim to address is environmental sustainability. And through this research, we were working to develop these nanomaterials that can assist in reducing emissions, and I, as I just mentioned. And it can also assist in reducing the waste from chemical and energy industries. And they can eat, these materials you know, can even be used in, in more environmental friendly manufacturing processes and energy efficient methods. Furthermore, these materials also have a great, uh, I believe, application in the efficiency in energy conversion and storage. And silica-based nanomaterials today, they can potentially enhance the performance and, uh, of devices such as solar cells, fuel cells. When we talk about chemical sensing and filtration, so these nanomaterials have potential applications in chemical sensing, where, for example, they can be used as the sensors to detect harmful chemical substances or infiltration systems to remove pollutants. And one of the most important applications, which I believe today is more in the biomedical science, where today a lot of, I should say, medical scientists in the field of biomedicine, they are using these materials to revolutionize the drug delivery systems because the unique properties of these materials can assist to target delivery of the various uh, chemical uh, cancer tackling medicines, which can improve the effectiveness of the treatment. And lastly, I believe this new technologies could even replace the conventional methods of treating the cancers, can even conventionally even eliminate the use of various only based devices in which you know thousands of dollars of uh, resources are being poured in by the hospital. So nanomaterials, they have wide range of applications. And overall, what I can say is that the desire of doing research into these nanomaterials is driven by the desire to uh, develop solutions that can address these global challenges. And by enhancing our understanding of these materials, we really hope you know, to pave the way for innovations that will contribute to a more sustainable and healthier future. Um, very well said, uh, Tabish, but, uh, you know, let me uh, bring this question to focus on the very critical relationship of the Indo-Pacific of India and Australia. You know, all these areas that you mentioned are of great concern to both the countries, including climate change. What would you say are the opportunities for building more cooperation in the research and development sector in science and technology for both these countries? Um, what are the partnerships that are possible that you have seen in your own career? Well, I believe there is immense potential for increased cooperation between India and Australia in the realm of research and development, particularly in science and technology, as you mentioned. And I believe the synergy between Australia's strong research infrastructure and India's rapidly developing technological landscape can very forge a powerful partnership. There are a lot of examples, but you know, to cite a few, if you talk about the joint research initiatives, you know, both countries, I believe there is still a big potential irrespective of so many pacts and partnerships which are there. We could even set up more joint research projects and initiatives which can help to share the knowledge and resource to tackle the global challenge like climate change, remail energy and healthcare. I'm very glad to mention that University of Queensland and IIT Delhi and Monash University and IIT Mumbai, today they are working really closely on it. But I believe as a researcher and scientist who is very much focused on sustainability, I still believe there is, is still a large amount of resonance in these two areas. There are a lot of gaps. It's still, there is a big potential for the two teams or the two countries to collaborate on a much more uh, impactful ways. 
Another very important way I believe is, you know, the exchange programs of research fellows and the students. I believe the, these greater exchange programs for students and faculty between the two countries could really uh, foster that cross-cultural understanding. Now, the recent example is, of course, the Australia India Strategic Research Fund, AI, AI SRF, which is you know, really formed to attract the talented and highly competitive graduates from uh, top level Indian higher education institutions with scholarship and other incentives to career advancement and entrepreneurship. But I believe it's a time where we need to encourage and leverage the IITs and IIMs alumni organizations in Australia, in addition to the Australian University alumni in India, to really make sure that we can really utilize that current output of the researches which is originating from the two countries to really synergize into a, some sort of a big strategic research fund. Another very really important aspect, and I would say that the Australian Indian business uh, uh, council really works very closely on it is the investment in the technology startups. Now, Australia, with its very robust economy, could invest in India's burgeoning uh, technology startup scenario, benefiting from the innovation and economic growth that these startups can often drive. Another big area, I believe, Rami, is I believe the collaboration in the space research. I think both India and Australia have established you know, space agencies and have shown a keen interest in space exploration. So I believe this area also presents a wonderful opportunity for collaboration. We have already have some programs as of 2022, which are existing where the Australian agencies, they really partner with the ISRO to map the areas which are mostly affected by the climate change. But I believe there is still some sort of lacunae or gaps where the two countries in terms of space minerals can you know, establish a very specialized research center. We know there is a specialized research center in critical minerals, which has recently come into shape with the recent visit of our honorable prime minister. But I believe in terms of space research, we can also pick up the strong advantage or leverage, which I should say ISRO has and can work with Australian engine. I believe, or with Australian counterparts. So I think these projects can be a win-win uh, scenario, uh, forming strong cross-cultural connections here on Earth while solving the mysteries even of the universe. Well, I hope the right people are listening to you right now, Tavish. But uh, tell me, till now, how do you assess the contribution of the Indian diaspora in the STEM industries? Well, I think uh, the Indian diaspora has made a very uh, substantial impact in the STEM industries. I should say not only in, in, in Australia, but worldwide. Their contributions are vast and, and significant in the sectors of IT, engineering, and healthcare. If you look at you know, leadership roles, there are so many individuals of uh, Indian origin today who have taken up you know, such strong leadership roles in global tech companies in Australia. Uh, Melbourne, where I am actually based in Victoria, is actually a hub of so many uh, STEM-based organizations, policy institutes, which are driven by the, either to totally by the people of Indian origin, or at, at least uh, their ancestors come from the India. In terms of academia and research, I believe Indian scientists and engineers have made a very important uh, contribution to our understanding of various complex phenomena. Indian diaspora has also created countless opportunities, you know, by setting up enterprises, contributing job creation. And, and lastly, I believe it really helps to bridge that uh, connection between the two countries. And it, it's also, I believe, really important that uh, these achievements are a testament to the value of uh, diversity in, in STEM fields. For example, if we talk about the entrepreneurship or the representation of academics of Indian heritage in at the lecturer levels who are employed at Australian universities, it's very interesting. The proportion keeps on rising by at least 2% from 2016 till 2023. There are at least, I believe, 400 to 500 large enterprises and corporations with directors and managers of Indian ancestry. This is the data actually from the Australian a website which says that 13% of them are actually women or from Indian origin. And the DFAT reports has recently indicated that uh, the effect of a generally highly educated, youthful, uh, linguistically diverse and growing community has plugged into a network of, I believe, innovation and into all, in all those sectors of science, technology and STEM, as you say. 
recently a uh, moody organization it has also mentioned that people of indian heritage are employed in at least 1000 australian organizations with uh, 2840 people as directors and which is almost like 3% of the australian population so i believe the indian diaspora is continuously shaping the australian economy and i believe if we can really cover up those gaps this relationship is simply going from you know just being a strategic partners but actually supporting each other to grow the, their economies in the world where economic crisis is always there so i believe indian diaspora has a very strong role uh, to play in the life of australia each and every day so you know of course uh, you know the, the indian diaspora not just in australia but world over seems to assimilate well has great uh, success stories to it but um, now that our focus is on australia uh, i think the world's focus is on the india australia relationship and as we are coming to the close of this interview let me ask you a final question uh, what has been your experience in australia as an indian migrant and what have been uh, the great foundational learnings maybe that you took with you from india to australia that have helped you in your success story well i believe whatever i am and i'm trying to do every day in my life as a researcher as a young scientist in australia this would never have been uh, possible based on the strong educational foundation which i started as i mentioned from my school life to university life in india so it has really shaped me in terms of facing the challenges challenging the stresses i still believe that the education uh, scenario at the young level from primary school to the university level is most one of the most stressful in india but at the same time it shapes you it it gives you that shine that you can actually contribute not only in environment which consist of people of indian origin but in economies which are very multicultural australia is a, i believe a hot pot of people from around the world and that's why moving to australia from india has been a very transformative transformative journey for me you know both professionally and personally i believe australia's emphasis on research and innovation it it definitely provided a thriving environment for my work it offered uh, numerous opportunities to collaborate with the distinguished researchers and academics and as i mentioned it, it's a melting pot of cultures and i believe this diversity it really brings richness to experiences ideas something that's particularly valuable in a field like research like any migration there have been challenges adjusting to a new country you know and culture being away from your family and friends and you need to navigate through that different work environment with all your initial struggles but over the time i believe you always found a sense of community and uh, i've been able to form the strong networks uh, i believe within my field and outside it and australia's commitment to advance scientific research its multicultural society it's a very welcoming place for a person like me from indian mig being an indian migrant and my experience here has definitely it's continuing shaping my career and personal growth in significant ways one thing which is very evident rami is people of indian ancestry in australia today there are more than 780000 which is increase of almost i should say by 20% since uh, 2010 so indians always they want to make it work and uh, they always want to contribute but uh, the most important thing they always keep their culture with them and that gives them a sense of pride to represent their country abroad so it has definitely shaped me and it's continue to shaping people uh, from different backgrounds who are assimilating into this vibrant culture of australia and contributing to the australian economy by carrying forward the legacy of india Well, Tabish, that was very eloquently put. Thank you so much. You know, we've reached the end of our interview, but you know, it is key people like you, you know, who help in the people to people connect and bringing this partnership to a level that it hasn't seen before. So, thank you very much. So, until next time, uh, thank you. Thank you.